Yes, okay. <laughs> now we're up and running. Uh, good morning, welcome uh, to uh, day two of this year's Eurocrypt here in Zurich. Um, <coughs> this is the session on uh, information theoretic security. And we're going to start with a presentation on uh, poly manipulation detection codes and applications by Tiago Bergamaschi. <coughs> Great. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Well, thank you all for coming to the first session. Uh, my name is Tiago. I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley. And today I'll be talking about uh, Pauli Manipulation Detection Codes, or PMDs, and some of their applications to quantum communication. So I wanted to begin with some broad motivation within the context of quantum error detection, and to hopefully give some um, context to the broader crypto community. So the question we study here is, when can a quantum code detect an arbitrary Pauli error? And to take a step back, you know, quantum mechanics is a fundamentally continuous theory. And yet, perhaps one of the key insights in the development of quantum error correction was that it really just sufficed to correct from a discrete set of errors or a basis. And in that context, the set of Pauli errors or n qubit Pauli operators, are nothing more than tensor products of single qubit Pauli operators, which are these two by two matrices, uh, also known as uh, the bit flip and phase flip operations, X and Z. And in turn, a quantum error correction or error detection code is just a, is just a subspace of some complex high dimensional Hilbert space. With that in mind, what does it mean to be an error detection code in this context? Well, suppose we start with a message, psi, and we encode it into our code by appending some security parameter and applying some reversible operation to it, like a unitary enc. And let psi bar be the resulting state. Now, suppose we take our state and we apply some unknown process to it. How do we check if it's being tampered with or not? Well, we just perform a measurement. And this measurement is defined by a projection, which is pi. And this measurement has two outcomes. We either get pi, and we conclude that nothing happened, or we get identity minus pi, and we conclude that someone tampered with our state. Now, if this seems a bit abstract, under the hood, well, the only thing we're really doing is reversing the encoding operation and checking if the string of all zeros in our security pad remains all zeros. But with this in mind, we can now ask, you know, what are the constraints on this measurement or the subspace to be able to detect from a class of errors? And this brings me to the main technical definition in my paper, which is the following. So I'll call a subspace, pi, to be an epsilon PMD code if for all errors e, the top singular value or the operator norm of pi e pi is bounded by epsilon. Now, this might seem a bit abstract at, at first, and it's written in a quantum information language, but really all, of it's, all that it's saying is that if you take two orthogonal code words in the subspace and you tamper with one of them, they remain nearly orthogonal. The inner product is still bounded by epsilon. That's all this is saying. And to some of you, this may still seem a bit abstract. So let me be a bit more concrete. Another way to interpret the same statement is that the measurement that I defined earlier rejects errors with high probability. So in particular, the left-hand side here takes a code state psi, it tampers with it with an error e, and it looks at the probability that the measurement outputs a false positive. Like, what it, what's the odds that we think that nothing happened while we actually tampered with the state, and the standard manipulations show that this is bounded by epsilon squared. So to some extent, this is a natural quantum analog to the seminal algebraic manipulation detection codes, or AMD codes, by uh, Kramer, Dodis, and Fair, incidentally. And th these are randomized codes which detect bit flip errors with high probability. Here, all we're doing is detecting bit flip and phase flip errors. Great. Unfortunately, to some extent, um, you may think that just detecting errors is not enough in the quantum setting. And the intuition for why is because if we're performing a measurement, the state that we get after the measurement might have collapsed to something completely different than what we had before. 
But the key intuition and the key idea in this paper is the fact that PMD codes detect errors without perturbing the, the corrupted code state. So in other words, if we take our corrupted code state E times psi, and we condition on the measurement rejecting, then the state we get back is still approximately close to the state we had before the measurement. And this is the key intuition behind our result. It, allow, it, it will allow us to sequentially use this, this code space behind our results, I guess. For purposes of comparison, Classical AMD codes have found numerous applications in the intersection of coding theory and cryptography. They've been used to designing secret sharing schemes by combining their properties with error correcting codes. They've been used to design non-malleable codes, by which are a certain relaxation of error correction and error detection. And they found applications to other areas of theoretical computer science, like extractors, multi-party computation, and more. And this brings me to the results in my paper. And here, arguably our main result is a, is a quantum secret sharing scheme. So this is a secret sharing scheme, but for quantum messages. And our secret sharing scheme is near optimal in the, in the sense that it approaches a coding theoretic bound known as the quantum singleton bound, which I'll describe shortly. And the, the, pr the approach is based on combining PMD codes, our, our new PMD codes, with a notion of list decodable error correcting code. Um, and can be un understood as a quantum analog to a paper by Kramer, um, Damgard, and others. Our second application is, a, is what I refer to as a quantum tamper detection code for a specific fa family of tampering channels that, um, that I call qubitwise channels. And this, what I found, find most notable about this result, as I'll discuss shortly, is that it offers a strengthening, uh, or it, it offers... Um, Guarant tampering guarantees that are provably impossible if the messages were classical. And so here, entanglement will play a key role. And finally, I present uh, constructions of PMD codes, but I don't think I'll have time to get into them today. Great. So with that, I can get to the first application. So many of you may have heard of the no cloning theorem. And that it just says that you can't take it, there's no procedure which takes an arbitrary state psi and produces two copies of it. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the no cloning theorem imposes a fundamental limitation on quantum error correcting codes, namely what's known as the quantum singleton bound, which just says that no quantum error correcting code of rate r, which is the ratio of encoded qubits to code qubits, can correct for more than a half of one minus r fraction of errors. So this is just half of the classical singleton bound. Now, it's not too hard to use the probabilistic method to show that codes approaching this bound exist. However, the issue with the probabilistic method is that it doesn't offer efficient solutions. And the main result in my work is a family of quantum error correcting codes of rate r, which corrects from a fraction of erasure errors, which are just errors where you know the location, approaching the quantum singleton bound, up to some inverse ex exponential approximation error. And from a cryptographic perspective, perhaps the main motivation for this result is a deep connection between uh, quantum error correction and secret sharing. And this connection, to spell it out, it really just says that if you can correct from a fraction of uh, if you can correct from errors on some subset of qubits, that implies that that subset had no information about the message at all. And so this is inherently a privacy property, and it's why that these codes are both error correcting codes and secret sharing schemes. Great. So a classical coding theorist in the crowd may think, why do we need all this fancy approximation? After all, classical codes like the repetition code can already correct from a maximal number of errors and a maximal number of erasures. So why do we need approximation? But it turns out this, that the secret lies in further coding theoretic bounds. Crepeau, Gottesman, and Smith, they showed that if you want to correct from adversarial errors exactly, the best that you can do is up to a quarter of the code. And if you'd like to correct from erasures over small alphabets like qubits, the best that you can do is just a third of the code. So fundamentally, if you want to approach half, 
which is the quantum singleton bound, you need approximation, at least over small alphabet sizes like qubits. Great. So with that, I wanted to give a sketch of how PMD codes come into play in this proof. And the intuition lies in the following thought experiment. Suppose we have two errors, E1 and E2, and we know what they look like. We have their description. And we're given some state psi, which lies in this magical PMD subspace. Given EI times psi, where we don't know what I is, can we recover the state psi? Now, it turns out that there's a very simple way to do this. And the algorithm is, first, let's try to correct E1. These are unitaries, so they're reversible. So let's just apply E1 dagger to it. And after which, we perform our measurement. If nothing happens, uh, that is, if we successfully output that, we're, that we lie in the code space, then we got our state back. But what if our measurement rejects? The key observation is that PMD codes detect without perturbing. So the state that we get after this measurement is just close to the state we had before. E1 dagger times E2, if the error was E2. So now we can revert the correction we just applied and try the next one. And it turns out that this intuition carries through if we were given a list of L different errors where the recovery error is related to L and the underlying constant epsilon. Now, I won't really have too much time to dive into how we construct an approximate error correcting code from this scheme, but perhaps the key idea is that we leverage an error correcting code that reduces the error model to a list of candidate errors, which is known as list decoding, and then we use PMD codes to break ties within the list. That's the, the overarching scheme. And I have some extra slides on this, but for simplicity, I think I'll just skip them. So with that gets me to my second application, which is on quantum tamper detection for a family of channels known as qubit-wise channels. The underlying motivation lies in quantum authentication schemes. So in a quantum authentication scheme, a sender and receiver who share a secret key attempt to communicate a quantum state over some untrusted channel, where the guarantee is that the decoder either gets the state back or rejects. Now, in seminal work, Barnum et al. proved that quantum authentication actually implies encryption, meaning that, someone who, meaning that the channel can't actually extract any information about the underlying message. And this hints at the connection between uh, tampering and privacy that I referred to earlier. And keep in mind that this is in strong contrast to classical authentication, where you can just add a small security tag and that already authenticates the message. The question we study here is, what can we achieve in a coding scenario without secret keys? So this brings me to the model we study, which is on quantum tamper detection. And here, the, which is in particular over qubit-wise channels. So here, we take our message psi and we encode it into n qubits. And each one of these qubits is sent to one of n different adversaries. However, all these n adversaries, they can't communicate and they can't share entanglement. And the goal we'd like to achieve is to either recover psi or reject. It's instructive to think about what would happen if we were just dealing with bits. I claim that this task is fundamentally impossible. And the reason why is because an adversary could just swap the message. They could all pre-agree to send over a fixed uh, or a valid encoding of a fixed message. So there would be, the decoder would essentially be none the wiser. They would never be able to check what, would hap what happened to the original message. And nevertheless, the intuition in the quantum setting is that while the adversaries are unentangled, the ciphertext or the cipher state could be highly entangled. And in principle, there's no way for the adversaries to swap the two. So with that, our main result, or the main result in this application is a tamper detection code over these types of channels, which achieves very high rate. Great. So 
The key tool in making this possible, in combination with the PMD codes, is the notion of a classical non-malleable code. So in a non-malleable code, it, it's formulated in a, similar, in a similar tampering setup, where a message is encoded, tampered with, and decoded. And the goal is to either recover the original me message M, reject, or output a completely uncorrelated message M prime. And uh, oh yeah, this is by Zimbowski, Piazak, and Wicks. Um, the key idea in, in this construction is, um, is to combine, uh, is essentially to devise a code which is divided into two pieces, a classical part and a quantum part, while the classical part is used to encode or present a non-malleable encoding of a secret key K. And the key K is then used to encrypt the quantum state. And this was used in, in my work, but also in um, concurrent and independent work by Bodu, Vipul Goyal, um, Rahul Jain, and Zhong Hibedu. And while I won't dive into too many details, technical details about how this works, the underlying intuition is that one can always treat these two components somewhat independently. And analyze the non-malleable code just by saying, you know, either the key is recovered, in which case the underlying state on the other register is completely encrypted, or the key is completely, um, or the key is not recovered, and what we get back is completely uncorrelated. And this ends up completely scrambling the state, um, resulting in something that's completely unentangled. And again, Perhaps I'll refer you guys to the paper for the technical details. With that, I kind of wanted to conclude by a digression on some future work. So perhaps the most interesting point left open by this work is what other forms of tamper detection are possible. So in follow-up work with Naresh uh, Bodu, who's on the other work on non-malleability, we showed that tamper detection is actually possible in the three-split state model which is kind of like the same thing, but just with three shares. And what I find to be the most interesting open question here is whether it's possible with two shares. Um, now, what about if the adversaries were actually entangled in the first place? Uh, many would consider this to be the more cryptographically motivated setting anyway. So there, the work by uh, BGJR showed that, or introduced the notion of non-malleability for codes uh, although non-malleable encryption had already been studied. And they developed codes in the, in the two-split state model, even against entangled adversaries. While I didn't really get into discussions on list decodability, there's a numerous questions on designing optimal list decodable codes and um, perhaps improving on my existing constructions of PMD codes. And uh, thank you very much. We have had time for questions. By now you know the drill. Use the microphone in the middle of the aisle, please. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, in, in the setting where, there's, uh, where entanglement is allowed, do you, is, is there anything possible if there's, uh, if there's no limit on the amount of entanglement, or do you need to limit it? That's a great question. So um, non-malleability, which is where you can output an uncorrelated message, was shown to be possible in this work by BGJR, uh, even in the two-split state setting with unbounded entanglement between the adversaries. And it turns out that tamper detection is possible even up to like a constant fraction of the code if you allow a bounded amount of entanglement between the adversaries. Right, but, uh, but for tamper detection, you need to limit the amount of... And, and yes, right? yes, yes. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. I also have a quick question. Did you think about proving lower bounds for uh, the, the, the rate for uh, PMD codes? Yes, and I couldn't. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> well, no, not good. <laughs> Any more questions? Then uh, let's thank the speaker again.
we move on to the next uh, talk of today yeah. on uh, non-malleable codes by <coughs> Marshall Ball, Ronan Schultiel, Judd uh, Silbach, and Judd will give the talk. Hey, okay, good, perfect. So, good morning. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk about non-malleable codes with optimal rate for poly size circuits. And this is a joint work with Marshall Ball and Ronan Schultiel. Good. So, let me start by talking about error correcting codes and not non-malleable codes, okay? And the usual story we tell ourselves is that we have some message M, we wish to send it through some noisy channel, and to do so, we're gonna first encode this message adding some redundancy. So hopefully now, when we send it through this noisy channel that induces, let's say, some fraction of errors, the other party can apply a decoding function and hopefully recover the original message, right? Good, and the rate of the code is the ratio, of course, between the length of the message and the length of the encoding, and we want this to be as large as possible. Good. Now, suppose we're in a setup in which we don't have really a bound on the amount of errors being induced, right? Maybe, usually, it's bounded, but with some small probability that does happen, right? Uh, we're, get, we're being hit by a lot of errors. So can we still give any guarantee in such a case, right? So the question is, if I don't have a bound on the errors, what kind of security guarantee can I hope to get? And of course, as you already heard this talk, the answer is uh, non-malleable codes, okay? Good, perfect. So what are non-malleable codes? Well, intuitively at least, non-malleable codes say the following. Either you recover the original message, or you get something completely unrelated, okay? So if no errors were applied, I want the uh, decoding procedure to be able to recover the message, but if some errors, or let's say, of even one bit of error was applied, then I promise you nothing other than the fact that you're either getting the original message or something unrelated. Good. So here's a formal definition, just to be on the same page, right? So it says the following, and encoding and decoding functions are non malleable for a class C, or for every C in this, uh, in this class of adversaries, if you also decode the encoding of M, which is to say no errors were applied, you recover M. But for every channel C, there exists a distribution DC, and this distribution is only dependent, right? This distribution is only dependent on the channel. It is not a function of the message, okay? And now I claim the following. These two experiments should be indistinguishable, okay? So in the first experiment, we decode the damage code word, right? C is inducing some errors to the encoding of M. And the other experiment, I'm going to sample from this DC distribution, which is independent from M, right? But whenever I see the symbol same in this distribution, I'm going to just plug in the message M, the original message M, OK? So what is this definition trying to say? This definition is trying to say the following. Well, DC is a distribution which is not dependent on M, right? And it's kind of marking only places in which it thinks the original message should be plugged in, okay? So intuitively, if these two experiments are indistinguishable, and now you can ask yourself, well, what kind of indistinguishability you get, right? It's, it could be statistical or computational. But intuitively, if these two distributions are indistinguishable, this means that the decoding of this non-malleable code gives you a message which is either the original message or unrelated to it. Good. So what do we know about this? Or let's be more specific about uh, what we mean by poly size circuits, okay? So poly size circuits is just saying for any fixed constant C, I wanna have a code or wanna construct the code that deals with circuits of size n to the C, okay? Now, the notion of non-malleability kind of implies that the decoding must run or must have some leverage or more resources than the actual channel. Because if the decoder can just, dec uh, or the if the adversary, sorry, can just decode the message, it could just encode something that is correlated with it. And of course, this would break the non-malleability. You would get something, the decoding part would give you something that is correlated with the message. Good. So it's implying that the decoding should run in a bit more time, and this is what we actually get. Now, note here that actually this is a very broad class of channels, if you think about it. Essentially, any uh, class of channels studied in formation theory, that such as burst channels, uh, minor symmetric channels, and et cetera, could all be implemented by, si by size even n circuits. 
OK? So if you give one code like this, this code would be good against all of them at the same time. OK? So this gives a unified uh, approach. Good. So what do we know about prior results on this subject? Well, the original work on differential privacy showed that these codes exist. Okay, so it's possible to construct non-malleable codes for poli-size circuits. Follow-up work showed that not only do these codes exist, well, they also, it's also possible to achieve rate which is optimal, which is 1 minus entropy of P. And this is done by improving the probabilistic argument. Okay. And the most relevant work to our result is the work of uh, Bol et al, which showed an explicit construction based, uh, based on hardness assumptions. However, the major caveat of this construction was that it had a very bad rate in some sense. Like the rate was only uh, one over n. Okay. So if you care about efficiency in some sense, maybe none of this is efficient. But like if you care about efficiency, this you could hope to improve this. Okay. Good. So let me say a few things about the hardness assumption used. Okay. So the hardness assumption used is a de-randomization assumption. Okay, it's not a cryptographic assumption, but a classic de-randomization assumption. And specifically, the hardness assumption used is that E is hard for exponential size non-deterministic circuits. Now, the slightly weaker version of this was used by uh, Empigliad Wigderson to prove the celebrated result that BPP is equal to P. Right? And the main difference is that in their assumption, they assumed that the uh, uh, the circuit is deterministic and not non-deterministic. Okay, but if you trust me, this is not a major. Uh, uh, like, this is a classic assumption by this point. People in complexity trust it implicitly. At least I do. But like uh, <laughs> to each his own. Okay, good. Perfect. So, what's our result? So let me now try to state our result. And our result is as follows: We give an explicit constructions for a non-malleable codes against circuits of size n to the c with optimal rate equals one, equaling 1 minus little of n. Uh, little of 1, sorry. OK. So unfortunately, like the previous result, we can't get negligible uh, uh, indistinguishability. right? We only get uh, inverse polynomial. You can choose any inverse polynomial you want, but you're going to pay, uh, pay for it in the runtime. And there are barriers that show that from these kinds of assumptions, you can't really help to get better. Okay. Let me just mention that if you're willing, right, if you're willing to assume more robust or non-standard cryptographic assumptions, you can hope to get negligible error. Okay. So the major caveat, or one of the uh, think something that could be desired, is that this only achieves computational indistinguishability and not statistical indistinguishability. However, however, we show that our technique is potentially able to get statistical indistinguishability by slightly improving some notion of hardness, which is called hard to sample functions. And this is a crucial, no, uh, crucial component in, in our construction. And I'll spend some time to explain what that means. Okay? And I think it has potential other applications in cryptography. Okay? So if this uh, pseudo-random object could be slightly improved, we potentially could get explicit uh, constructions with statistical security. Good. So why should you care, right? Why is this useful? Well, to start off, now that we have a code that has such optimal rate, I think that one of the advantages of having such codes for circuits is that you can compose them now with other primitives that you, will, uh, you might like. Okay? So a classic example would be, let's now compose this objects with error correcting codes in general. Okay? So I want a code that has two properties. That is first going to recover from some fraction of errors. Okay, so maybe I'm in a setup in which usually it's the case that I'm hit by, let's say, 1 over 10 fractions of errors. But in some like, uh, rare equations, I'm, like, the message itself is being completely deleted and something else is being written. Okay? So I want a code that is still able to recover from, say, fraction period of errors. but if more than that, or more errors were applied, then I want the property of being non-mullable. And that is to say, if more than p errors are applied, the message I get is unrelated to the original message. Okay? Sure. 
And note here that in this setup of uh, circuits, it's not hard to get this property by just composition. Right? If you choose the outer code or you, you take your message, you encode it first by non malleable code and then encode it by uh, a code against uh, p fractions of errors, what you would get is a code that has two properties. But it's not obvious how to get this or get this type of result for more restricted classes of channels. So if your class of channels is like space bounded or something like that, it's not obvious how you can get these two properties by composition. Okay, so you would require some different construction. Good. Now, it makes sense to choose any code you want here, right? But we think it makes sense because we're already in a setup in which the errors is being bounded, right? It makes sense to choose, let's say, the uh, result of uh, Shell, and Silbach uh, from, that's going to appear in uh, stock in a few weeks that shows that it's possible to have explicit error correcting codes for bounded classes, let's say space and circuits, that has better rate than what's information theoretically possible. Okay? So if, if your adversary is information theoretic, you can't hope to get such a high rate. And here the rate is 1 minus entropy of P. And you, it's strictly larger. But since you're only dealing with adversaries that are computationally bounded, in a sense, you can have a rate that matches the binary symmetric, binary symmetric channel uh, rate. Okay? And this is kind of saying, OK, as a corollary of our result is that you can now have both best of both worlds, in a sense. You can have a rate for error correction that is strictly better than what's possible information theoretically. And if you are hit by more fractions of errors, then what you have is that the message is going to be unrelated. OK? Good. OK, so with the time I have left, I'm going to talk a bit about this cool notion of hard to sample functions, which is a central like primitive in our construction, and we think it might or should find other applications. Okay. So what's a hard to sample function? Okay. So first of all, this is a pseudorandom primitive. Okay. It's not a cryptographic primitive, it's a pseudorandom primitive, and it says the following. A pseudorandom or hard to sample function from n bits to n prime bits is a function that has the following property. We say it's HHTS for size n circuits, if for any adversary drawn from this class of adversaries, of size n to, to the C, if this adversary samples, like it takes A, it takes some randomness, and it samples x and y, the probability that x is not in H and that y is equal to f of x is small. Okay, so what is this intuitively saying? What this is intuitively saying is that it's hard to produce pairs of the form x f of x. Okay. Now, if you think about it, I can't really make an adversary not be able to draw such distributions at all, right? Because any non-uniform distribution, any non-uniform adversary can be just be hardwired with pairs of x and f of x for any f, right? So the best you can hope for is a notion that actually limits this capacity in some sense. Okay. So what I want is some measure of how much or how many pairs you can produce or how many uh, correct, distri uh, correct uh, uh, looking distribution pairs you can hope to get. Is this clear? Okay. Okay. So the best you can hope for is poly n circuits. And let me just say that if you think about it, this is kind of similar to the notion of keyless multi-collision resistance has functions that are by now kind of uh, uh, used extensively. And unlike this notion, let me just point out that f is uh, f runs in more time than the actual channel itself, which is a setup that is not very cryptographic in a sense. Okay. Good. So, uh, in our result that is going to appear in a few weeks, we showed that these objects exist under the same assumption we discussed before. That is, E is hard for exponential size circuits. However, in our construction, if f is shrinking, as we would want it here, uh, the set size or the size of the bound you get on the size of the set h is super polynomial. Okay? If it's not shrinking, then you get an optimal size. But if it's shrinking, you get uh, something that is not uh, optimal. And we think it should be possible to, like, to improve this and get an optimal result. Perfect. So let me just give you a very, very high level overview of our uh, technique. 
I'm not going to go over details. I'm just going to show one nugget. Okay. So loosely speaking, very like hand wavy. Uh, in the results, uh, Silbeck showed that it's possible to get some a notion that is kind of similar to non-malleability. It's, it's a, you can think of it as slight variation, and just like to, and this notion is called small set non-malleability. Intuitively, at least for the sake of this talk, you should think about it as just the having non-malleability and hard to sample functions at the same time. Okay, so it's a combination of being hard to sample and being non-malleable. Okay. And it appears that this notion is like much, much, much easier to compose with other primitives. So notoriously, non-malleable codes are hard to compose with other things because once you show some side information, the non-malleability does not really hold. But it turns out that small set non-malleable codes are easier to handle, and this enables us to actually compile them to codes that, are, uh, that have rate that is equal to one uh, minus little of one. However, unfortunately, this transformation uses some uh, seed extending properties and uh, et cetera, which only gives us computational security. Okay? However, as I already discussed, it's possible right, that if we had this stronger variant of hard to sample functions, which has h that is of polynomial size, then there exists a general transformation that takes any non malleable code, any non malleable code with computational indistinguishability and gives you a statistically indistinguish uh, gives you statistical indistinguishability the one restriction or the one thing i ask of this uh, uh, non malleable code is that it has a simulator okay the simulator which should run in slightly more uh, more efficient time than the actual computational indistinguishability but not much okay so it's a general transformation, and we think it should be like it could probably be applied to other cases in cryptography, in which we don't have a bound, or we we have a simulator which we know the bound on. Okay, and in such cases, you probably could go from computational distinguishability to statistical indistinguishability. Okay, so let me just th say how this works in a second. Okay, so it's really kind of simple. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go to the main technical part. And the idea is as follows. So if you have a, a hard to sample function f, well, suppose n prime and dec prime is an unmalleable code that has computational security. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna encode m by encoding not m, but m and f of m, okay? So I'm using this hard to sample function. And remember that any adversary would find it hard to produce these pairs together, m and f of m, right? And the decoding is just going to be very simple here. What the decoding is going to do is going to first apply the decoding deck prime on this received damage code word, take some candidate m hat y hat. And if y hat is not equal to f of m hat, it's going to produce, uh, sorry, if it's equal, it's just going to output m hat. Otherwise, it's just going to abort because it's not a valid uh, looking uh, message. Okay? So it gives you some ability to detect if it is uh, the co correct message or not. Okay, and the proof is going to be very simple in this respect, right? So the proof is going to say the following: If f is HTS function against a simulator of this non-malleable code, right? As we said before, if f is able to fool the simulator, note that this simulator should be able to produce this distribution with only after it only gets randomness, right? So, and we know that by the properties of the hard-to-sample function, it's hard to produce these kinds of pairs of x and f of x. OK? So what this is implying is that the distribution you get from the simulator after you abort whenever it's not of the correct form has very small support, right? The support of this distribution is essentially limited only to the set H, which is guaranteed from the hard to sample functions. OK? And now it's, it's obvious in a sense that for a distribution that has small support, any computational indistinguishability implies statistical indistinguishability, right? Because any statistical test you can think of could just be implemented efficiently in computation, uh, uh, efficiently, and as such, computational indistinguishability will immediately translate to statistical indistinguishability. Good. So this is not the technical part of our paper. This is like the less technical part, but it shows that the usefulness of hard to sample function, which is, I think is a primitive that could find other applications in, uh, in, uh, in, com in complexity and uh, cryptography. 
Good. So let me conclude. So as I said, our main result is to get optimal non-malleable codes for poly size circuits. Okay. And we think there's an interesting direction here about for construction codes with non-malleability and error correcting codes. So it's possible you should hope to get the best of both worlds in a sense that you can get non-malleability and error correction without paying much or anything in some sense. And as for open questions, well, can we get statistical security? We already showed here that it's possible. For technical, like for the actual construction could be improved if we had like slightly better uh, dispersers or something like that. So it's very much a, a goal that is possible to achieve. And could we apply this like general key encapsulation technique for other uh, non-malleable primitives and objects? And we think it's uh, it's an interesting direction to uh, like in general, and maybe for other classes of uh, functions. So that's it in general. Any questions? We have time for a quick question, if there is one. If not, then you can grab a chat in the coffee break anyway. Yeah? <laughs> Let's uh, thank him once more. Thank you. And we move on to the third talk in this session <coughs> on uh, approximate lower bound arguments by Piros Chaidos, Agelos Kiaias, Leo Reisin, and Tolik Tsinoviev. Uh, and Tolik is going to give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the topic of approximate lower bound arguments, or ALBA in short. And the problem we are solving is as follows. Uh, the prover has many elements uh, of interest indicated by the predicate R, and he wants to convince the verifier that he knows more than nf elements of interest with R equal to one. Um, of course, he can just send nf plus one elements to the verifier, but that's inefficient if nf is large. Um, but we can solve this problem more efficiently if we introduce an extra assumption, and that is the prover actually knows NP elements of interest, where NP is significantly larger than NF. Um, and then the prover will send only some elements to the verifier with some special properties. And uh, the larger the ratio NF over, uh, sorry, NP over NF is, the more efficiently we can solve this problem. We can also slightly generalize this and introduce uh, weights. So now each element will have some integer weight. Um, we replace the predicate R with a weight function W, which for an element outputs its integer weight. And the new goal is for the prover to show to the verifier that he knows enough elements with total weight more than nf. And the new assumption is that the prover knows elements of total weight np. And we call this problem approximate lower bound arguments, or ALBA in short. So actually, this problem has um, somewhat long history. Uh, this primitive was uh, designed and used uh, in the 80s in the context of complex uh, um, theory, but uh, those constructions all have interaction and large proof sizes, and we set our goal to uh, construct this primitive for real-world applications. And in particular, we would like to minimize the proof size, so we actually care about the numbers, not only about the asymptotics, uh, we want non-interactivity, meaning the prover simultaneously convinces all present and future verifiers. We want fast prover and verifier. We also want to uh, minimize communication complexity in uh, the decentralized setting where the knowledge of the elements is uh, uh, kind of spread out across multiple uh, disjoint provers that you need to communicate. And finally, we want extractability, which is formalized by proof of knowledge. 
Uh, here's how we define this primitive. Uh, in the random oracle model, we have prover and verifier with access to the random oracle H and the weight oracle W. And we have two usual properties, completeness and soundness. For completeness, we say that uh, if the prover has elements of total weight and P, then the proof produced will be accepted by the verifier. And for soundness, we want to say that if there is a program A that outputs a valid proof, then the program A actually knows enough elements of total weight more than NF. Um, and this is um, formalized by proof of knowledge. So we say that there is a program extract with access to the program A that outputs uh, ele elements with b big enough weight. And we have a similar definition also in the CRS model. Uh, for our results, we bound completeness and soundness errors to be at most two to the minus lambda. And for now, for simplicity, I assume that NP is equal to two times NF, meaning that uh, the prover knows elements of total weight twice as large as the weight to be proven. And then uh, the proof size is only lambda plus log lambda plus six elements. And for 120 bit security, this is only 141 element. Uh, the cool thing about uh, our implementation construction is that the most expensive um, operation by the prover and verifier is computing a hash function, which is really fast. And we proved that um, the prover only computes all of n plus lambda squared Hashes, hashes in expectation, while the verifier computes only of lambda hashes. Uh, we identify several applications for this primitive. The first one is uh, for improving a straight line evidence extraction for SNARKs. As a reminder, a SNARK is a proof system where the prover outputs a single small proof that convinces the verifier of knowledge of some witness W for some statement S. And um, the work by Ganesh et al. from last Eurocrypt constructed the first um, uh, snark in the universal composability framework. And if you recall, this framework requires uh, witness extraction without rewinding the prover. Uh, in other words, in a straight line manner. But since the proof pi must be much smaller than the whole witness W, you might ask how, how do you actually extract the whole witness uh, without rewinding the prover? And the answer is it's possible in the random oracle model. Uh, because in the random oracle model, uh, the extractor has additional power if you can kind of sp spy on the random or oracle queries by the prover and get some extra information. Uh, so the way they do it is they represent the witness W as some degree deep polynomial and commit to it using some polynomial commitment scheme. And then the prover uh, proves to the verifier that the random oracle was queried on d plus one valid points. And if that's the case, then the extractor can uh, interpolate the polynomial and get the whole witness. But they do so by querying lambda times d points. And we observe that this is just an application of ALBA. And using um, our construction, we can have a prover that queries only two times d points, which makes the prover a factor of lambda times faster. And this is um, also gets us a more modular construction. Um, then we also considered uh, a setting where the elements are spread out across multiple disjoint provers that need to communicate. So in our setting, uh, each prover sends some message to the aggregator 
who will in turn produce the final proof pi for the verifier. And um, among all the other goals, we would also like to minimize the number of provers that communicate at all. And for our results, again, we bound um, completeness and soundness errors to be at most two to the minus lambda, and let's assume that NP is equal to two times NF. And then we have uh, the proof size lambda plus of square root of lambda elements, which is close to just lambda elements. Uh, the prover, uh, each prover computes exactly one hash. The aggregator computes uh, of lambda squared hashes in expectation, and the verifier still computes of lambda hashes. And finally, we uh, show that only of lambda squared provers um, send a message, to, a message to the aggregator where each message is just one data element. Um, an application for this setting is uh, with multi-signatures where the goal basically is uh, to convince the verifier that the prover um, has enough signatures that sign some message. And that's um, particularly useful in proof-of-stake blockchains where um, the nodes with stake want to collaborate to attest to the current blockchain state. Let's assume that 80% um, of, of the stake belongs to honest um, nodes and 20% of the stake belongs to malicious nodes. That's a common assumption in, in blockchains. And basically, if, if we know that uh, more than 20% of the stake uh, signed the blockchain state, then we can be confident then that at least one node was honest. And so we set NP over NF to be equal to four in, in, in the terminology of ALBA. And the protocol is uh, as follows. Uh, each node signs uh, the blockchain state and uh, the weight of the node's signature is just the node's um, stake in the system. And then we aggregate those signatures using, for example, a decentralized ALBA. And what we get is um, small proof sizes as well as small communication. In particular, for 128-bit security, uh, only under 2,000 nodes send a signature to the aggregator, and the final proof size is only 104 signatures. And we have also more improved numbers um, compared to the proceedings in the full version of our paper on ePrint. Now I'll talk about how it's actually done, but to give you an idea of uh, what solving this problem entails, I'll first um, show you a simple construction where the prover is inefficient. And uh, for simplicity, let's assume that elements have weights either zero or one. And recall that um, the honest prover has NP elements and the malicious prover has NF elements. And let's uh, let the proof size to be U elements where we choose U uh, later. And then we consider all sequences of elements of size U. Then the honest prover who has an NP elements has NP to the power of U such sequences. And the malicious prover has only an F to the power of U sequences. And notice this exponential gap, NP over NF to the power of U. This is the gap that we want to kind of exploit to get a small proof size U. And we define basically um, a valid proof to be a sequence chosen with some small probability epsilon 
by the random oracle or the random function. Uh, here's a specification of a valid proof. It's a sequence of u elements s1 through su that hashes to one where the random function alpha is one with probability epsilon. And if we set completeness and soundness errors to be at most two to the minus lambda and calibrate the probability epsilon, we can find that u equal to lambda plus log lambda divided by log np over nf elements um, suffices for the proof size. And that's um, pretty, op pretty close to the optimal due to our lower bound. However, because the number of such sequences is exponentially many and the probability epsilon is very small, the prover here has exponential running time. And so basically we want to mm, exploit this exponential gap and p over nf to the power of u, but efficiently. And the idea here is that um, we basically consider such sequences of increasing size, but we keep the number of sequences at each step small. And we call this method telescope. And here's how it works. I assume again that elements have weights either zero or one, and uh, let x1 through xn be the honest provers elements. And then the prover starts with d integers one through d, and he pairs them with each of his elements, x1 through xn. And now the prover has d times n such pairs. And that's more than we would like. So we allow each pair to survive with probability of one over n. And then the prover is left with approximately d pairs on average. So now we repeat this thing. We again pair these pairs with each of honest provers elements, x1 through xn, and now the prover has uh, approximately d times n triples, and we again select each triple um, to be left to survive with probability one over n, and now the, the prover has approximately d triples. And so we repeat this procedure u times, and at the end of, the, of this um, algorithm, the prover has approximately d tuples of one integer and u elements. And those are the tuples that are considered to be valid proofs, valid certificates. And here's the specification. A valid proof is a tuple with one integer t and u elements s1 through su, such that t is between one and d, and each prefix of the uh, tuple hashes to one, where the hash function alpha is one with probability one over n. And actually, for technical reasons, we also hash the whole tuple with a different uh, random function, h2, which alpha is one with probability q, um, but that's not very important. And so, um, as I was saying, the prover maintains approximately d tuples of each size. And so the number of tuples that he has basically resembles some random walk around the initial value d. However, the malicious prover who, has, who doesn't have n elements, he has fewer elements, the number of the tuples that he maintains must decay exponentially. And we can easily show that um, the malicious prover has a full tuple that's successful only with negligible probability. So um, this scheme is uh, way more efficient than the previous one, but this is not our most efficient scheme. Um, 
We also have a telescope with precession, uh, whose prover is even faster, but I, uh, due to time constraints, I cannot tell you how it works. But uh, thanks to a software engineer at IOG who prototyped uh, this construction, we have some pre preliminary um, measurements of the prover running time. And basically, uh, if we assume that NP over NF is equal to four, then the prover um, proven knowledge of 20,000 elements using 80,000 elements uh, runs on average for one and a half seconds. And actually because uh, when we were working on this paper, we, uh, we were mostly concerned about the asymptotics. Uh, I expect that uh, these numbers can, can go down even further. So in, in this talk, I didn't um, discuss uh, how this construction works, and unfortunately, I also didn't uh, talk about uh, analyzing the average and worst case prover prove running time or the construction of the decentralized telescope. I didn't talk about uh, how we add support for weights, uh, about knowledge extraction in the random Oracle and the CRS models, and I didn't talk about lower bounds. But all of this can be found in the full version of our paper on ePrint. Um, it's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I guess everyone wants to go for coffee. So uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>